done. And again, these are different things and a lack of time, but the basic idea is there. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly conclude here, right? So what is the basic idea? The basic idea I think is through this. So we now have a good model. That particular model represents what happens with very low to very high, okay? That is the first condition for doing uh, uh, any research, yeah, CCI, fluid percussion model, or a blood. You have to have some relationship between how you are able to control what you are controlling and what is the relevancy of this to the actual conditions. This relevancy has to be established. If they don't establish, we can get a lot of results, very nice papers, but really doesn't translate. And that has been the problem with, with the TBA for a long, long time. And once you have a model, then we vary them very, very accurately and try to look at one mechanism or the other, including MRI, CT issues and other issues, and try to look at this and see what is the effect of them. For example, is it the position, gender, what effects is taking place, okay? So I think we have a number of publications in this area. What? I can't talk. That's the last slide. It's missing. Thank you, okay. Professor. Oh, this is my group. I need to acknowledge it. It's important. <laughs> okay. This is our group here. Our group consists of not only biomechanical people, people from biochemistry, and also a lot of biomedical people. So basically, I think there's a lot of people involved. What I do is, once I control the injuries, I really collaborate with people who are the experts in this particular field, so we can comprehensively address the insults, the injury, to also medical outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shortage of time, uh, I think there is no time for questions. So we can interact during the lunch session. Okay, okay. all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we go on to the next session, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, the delegates who are taking part in the poster session, can you please put up your posters? Because the judges are ready to view them and they shall be judging them during the lunch break. Uh, if any of you need the Wi-Fi, there's no password protection to it. So this place is a free Wi-Fi zone. The conference, you can also view the conference live and it's on the YouTube as well. And obviously this conference has had a lot of uh, support from our industrial friends. So to give them encouragement as well, we've been doing this every year. We have a lucky draw. So what you need to do for that is to go to each of the stalls and uh, get a signature from them on your lucky draw coupon, which is along with your lunch coupons. And uh, the draw shall be on the 31st. Um, we'll move on to our next session. May I invite the chairpersons for the next session? Dr. Manmohan Singh is already here, sir. May I also invite Dr. H.S. Chabra He's the director for the Indian Spinal Injury Center. I would also like to invite our guest from Egypt, Mustafa Koth. Have I got the name right? Can you just call, sir, please? No? He's gone out? Okay. He's gone somewhere? Okay. So a little uh, matter of concern, we are short of time and I would request uh, all of our speakers please be on time. Uh, I think if it, they can uh, finish off a little ahead of it, it will be highly appreciated. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Sujata Bhavanti from Orani Institute of Medical Sciences. She will be speaking on stem cell therapy in TBI and spinal cord injury, an overview. Hi, good afternoon everybody. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And I think I am the odd person out here. I'm not a neurologist nor a neurosurgeon. And I would like to bring together the role of stem cells in, in traumatic brain and spinal cord injury. So this is the overview of my presentation. So what is the problem? How we are going to address it? 
using both clinical, preclinical, and basic research, keeping AIMS as a model, whatever work which has been done in AIMS, okay. and what should be the next step, how to reach the optimized level of uh, stem cell uh, research. So what are the problems? The problem right now which we are going to address is the injury to the brain and the nervous system. And because we know that there is local deformation, and as Professor Chandra said, there's a biochemical cascade of the insult in terms of pro-inflammatory molecules, apoptosis, and which further leads to more cellular changes, and that can really hamper and give you long-term injury. So can the stem cell come in and help us? So that, that is the, we are going to focus on. And we, we would like to take the help of stem cells because they are supposed to repair and have the regeneration capacity. The unique problem regarding brain and the spinal cord is that the cells which are needed or which are destroyed, they need to interconnect with each other and they need to communicate to do their functionality. So that is very important. It is something like uh, other cells which you need to be there and secrete some factors. But here they need to interconnect and communicate. If we see the level of regeneration in humans, you can divide it into three categories. So one is like, you can see high, moderate, and low, and brain is coming into the third category. Although it has few pockets of resident stem cells in it, but it, they are not that active when the person reaches the adulthood. So if a moment, if we think that there is no regeneration, what happens in a global scenario, these are some of the list of the diseases which I have marked here, which is um, making India uh, really a, um, a huge financial burden. So in all these diseases, there are certain organ and tissues and cells which are destroyed. And some of the current drugs and treatment are not able to <coughs> fulfill their target. So what is the option left for us? We can think of organ transplant, but again, they are very expensive, shortage of donor, and in some of the cases, it is not applicable like brain, you cannot totally do the brain transplant. So if stem cell can augment in some of these diseases. So at AIMS, we took up this uh, research in stem cells using three components, the preclinical, clinical, and basic, and I'll go one by one in these area. In animal studies, because they are very good for uh, establishing proof of concepts. So this was the first study, we tried to do it in a rat sciatic nerve transaction model in the star rats to see if bone marrow derived mononuclear cells can be helpful. We made two groups. So one group was test group and the second was for the control. In test group we gave bone marrow mononuclear cells mixed along with the fibrin glue which acted like a scaffold and in the control group we only gave fibrin sealant, no stem cells from the bone marrow. We did the evaluation at day 30 and day 60. So you can see here, this is the model. The side G represent where there was a nerve transaction. And we did the study histopathologically, both distal as well as the proximal, which is 5 mm and 10 mm. That means four section was taken from the site of injury, 5 mm, distal and proximal at day 30. So we did all this panel of tests to see all the microvasculature, myelination, and fibrosis. So let's see what happens at the site of repair, day 30. You can see here, this is the test and the control. Most exons are well oriented and here there are few degenerative changes. In terms of neurofilament assessment, you can see there's a marked difference here as compared to the control group. And the myelination ring formation is much better here as compared to this. This is at day 30. And same was observed at day 60 also. And this is at 5 mm distal portion at day 30, the same observation. And this is at day 60. So you can, in a nutshell, we can say that exon regeneration is better. Demyelination, you get thick re remyelination, less Schwann cell proliferation, and lesser degree of degeneration and inflammatory changes in the group which received bone marrow mononuclear cells as compared to the control group. So what about the doses? In this, everything was uh, the, the same. So does dose uh, has some effect on it? We did the second study where we kept two groups uh, with low dose and high dose with control group with only PVS injection into that site. Again, the same parameter was followed, same things. So in a nutshell, you can see here high group of uh, bone marrow mononuclear showed better myelination and a better uh, response to the higher dose of bone mononucleus at day 30 as well as 
at day 60. Sorry, I think it's the day 60. That means higher concentration of cell dose has significantly has faster and better recovery in them. So now we have only given unprimed stem cells. What happens if we give primed cells which are really primed into neuronal lineages? So for that, we need to do understand the biology of the stem cells. How do they differentiate into neurons and specifically into dopaminergic neurons? So this was done by my PhD students. She was interested and published this article that of all the inducers chemicals present, only FGF2 alone can have good potential to differentiate bone marrow uh, mesenchymal stem cells into neurons. So we did morphological analysis. You can see here these are stem cells and they are changing their morphological features. That at a higher magnification, they are showing typical cell body and neurite uh, projections. At the gene level also, they are changing their genotyp genotypics in terms of all the markers of neurons. These are the panel of markers here. I'll not go into the detail. And at the protein level, this is beta-3 tubulin at twitch one The green color shows that these cells, stem cells are getting accumulating neuronal markers. So in terms of TH positivity, so we can see that some of the cells also acquired that, that is dopamine transporter, the red one, and they are turning into dopaminergic neurons. So what about these are having all the markers of neurons and dopaminergic? The functionality is very important. So this is a single cell which shows that changing the red intensity means they are showing act action potential upon getting KCL treatment. If you activate them, they are functionally releasing dopaminergic and getting uh, activated. So functionality wise also they are good enough. So we took these cells into the animal model. So this is a unilateral Parkinson model which we created in the lab. And you can see here, this is unilateral model. It is rotating at one side. And the second one after injection, this is just after two months, uh, the rotation has stopped and it has uh, shown uh, normal behavior. So the study is still uh, ongoing. So these stem cells have worked in in vitro model. So now I'll focus on some of the clinical research which was done at our center. So these are the three major publications where it has been published. And in a nutshell, so first one was the pilot study using uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Second was, and the third one was phase one, uh, non-randomized. The third one was phase two randomized multicentric trial. You can see here the, uh, the number of patients here is 12, 12, and 120 in both the arms, 60 plus 60. So in a nutshell, uh, the earlier two studies showed that mesenchymal stem cells and bone marrow mononuclear cells are safe and feasible. The third one says, apart from the safety, there was no um, beneficial outcomes in, in this group. This was the largest one, uh, the study which we did as a ran uh, randomized control trial. But recently, I think last month, there was one paper in stem cell and development which says they have also used autologous bone marrow mononuclear cells in, in these patients. So they have taken 12, six, six group in each, high versus low dose. This is very important. And uh, they took historic controls and the evaluation was one, three, and six months. So what was the conclusion is that autologous bone marrow stem cells, it's feasible and safe. And they showed at higher dose, uh, they showed much improvement. That means we need to work on the dosage and the route of injection, which I'm not touching right now. The next step is what? So we, if you see the, the current scenario, the worldwide, a type of stem cells apart from bone marrow mononuclear cells is called mesenchymal stem cells. They are taking the lead in all the clinical trials. So these cells, they need expansion in culture. Like bone marrow mononuclear cells, you need to only enrich them. Do not need to expand them. But these cells are much less than hematopoietic stem cells, so you need to expand them in culture condition. So whenever you are expanding them, um, this is the number of studies right now in spinal cord injury and in traumatic brain injury, which is going on using mesenchymal stem cells till yesterday. So as I told you, these stem cells, when you are expanding them, they need to be expanded in good manufacturing practices, and they are treated like a drug. So basically, GMP ensures that these stem cells should be safe, pure, and adequate before they are being injected into the humans. So these are certain guidelines, and we have our own national guidelines for stem cell research. Keeping that in mind, we made our stem cell CGMP lab uh, in the first floor of uh, Arbo complex, and this is the basic research lab. So this was inaugurated last year by our ex-health minister, and this is the inside of the facility, few views. 
These are the pass boxes through which the material is transferred. These are the people who are working inside, making SOPs and guidelines for the expansion of cells. These are quality control uh, assessments and cryopreservation of stem cells. So now I'll highlight, highlight on three aspects like people are venturing into the next level. First one is umbilical cord blood stem cells. Second is exosomes. And third one is induced pluripotent stem cells. So this is a study which is going to take on in, in Chicago where they are going to target children who have undergone traumatic brain injury and whose cord blood has been preserved in the cord, blood re, um, cord bank registry. So this is a very good example of having a public cord uh, bank <coughs> where you can have your own uh, stem cells for the uses in this. So it is yet to take off and this is very interesting. The second one is the use of exosomes, both in stroke and traumatic brain injury. So just to tell you how exosomes are different from stem cells, this is a stem cell, it gives out exosomes, just like small vesicle, they are very, very small, around 40 nanometer, and when they are released, they get attached to a recipient cells, which needs, needs it, get inside the cells and does the repair through RNA and protein. So this is another mechanism by which stem cell work. So this is the mechanism. And these are two studies which I quoted <coughs> earlier. They showed that intravenous administration of these micro uh, vesicles or exosomes, they had much better functional recovery. It enhances neurite remodeling, neurogenesis, angiogenesis, and it reduces uh, neuroinflammation. So this is also very upcoming. People are thinking of using not stem cells, but stem cell derived exosomes for uh, repair. This is IPS, for which in 2012, Professor Yamanaka from Japan won the Nobel Prize. Like how you can make skin stem cells behave, or any adult stem cell behave like embryonic stem cells. Here they took skin cells from an 86 year old patient, reprogrammed into IPS, made neural stem cells, and then it was used in a um, animal model, rat model, over along with the scaffold. So these neuride uh, cells, uh, when they were grafted after three months, they showed extensive exo uh, exonal growth, and they reached from one end to the other. So this is very important that they not at the site also. Again, they reached from the top to the bottom. The, the bottom line is like using this technique, you can bypass embryonic stem cells, which are not to be used for clinical purposes. And you can be sure that 86-year-old persons cells can be potentially good enough in maintaining the regeneration potential. So this is a really good thing. Like you can have autologous uh, stem cell uh, system here using this IPS technology. So there's another side uh, of stem cell story, which is flip side. So Giron was the first company which started embryonic stem cells for spinal cord injury. Dr. Manti, you just need to just- uh, Okay, this uh, is the last one. Yeah. So this trial was stopped after three patients was involved because in animal model, these ES cells showed presence of teratoma, that is a tumor. So, and I'll just keep this. To have an ideal therapy, we need to cross over so many uh, hurdles. These are some of the one, I'll not grow through it. Through it. To have an optimized cell-based therapy. We are really very far away from that, but it should not stop us from doing much extensive research into the each aspect of this point which I've highlighted here. So the work which I presented here is collaboration with so many other centers within AIMS and outside aims, so I'll not name, name one of them. Um, of course, generous funding from DBT, ICMR, and AIMS is acknowledged in these studies. These are the few people who have worked in, with me in the lab, and she's the main person who is working on neurons. And thank you very much. Uh, we'll have the question and answers after the uh, debate. Uh, otherwise, you can talk to Dr. Mahanti in the lunch session. So our next feature speaker is going to be Dr. Deepa Agarwal. Is he here? Dr. Deepa Agarwal. Okay. So Dr. Deepa Agarwal is not here. So we move on to the next session. That is the controversies in the neurotrauma debate on stem cell usage in the spinal cord injury. So, uh, Dr. Deepak Gupta is going to moderate this session. Can we have the presentations?
All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in this hall, I have been lucky enough to uh, ask uh, the stalwarts, I would say, who can really debate on stem cells, the current status. We have with us uh, Dr. H.S. Chhabra, who probably, to my understanding, has got the largest uh, clinical experience, and he's probably the only person in our country who does have a publication on stem cells, if I'm not mistaken. We have uh, Professor Matthew Joseph with us, and uh, who is a very ardent debater, and I don't know for, if they have end up with a fist fight at the end, because both are equally strong. Matthew happens to be slightly taller than uh, Dr. Chess Chhabra. Uh, but yes, on a very serious note, uh, we have to really see to it that stem cells, whenever this uh, topic comes in mind, if you are a layman, this is the only hope. In our country, like India, people talk about either God or stem cells. There is nothing beyond that. If you talk about the people who are slightly learned, probably including me and rest of the neurosurgeons sitting out here, we say it's trash. It is nothing. If you talk to the basic scientists who are kind of working on the translational research, you say, yes, we are getting good evidence of stem cells uh, why they are not getting translated into the clinical thing yet to be seen. So that's the whole idea of we have uh, kept this debate because stem cells, we feel that it's a solution for everything. So are the stem cell therapy centers that are really following the guidelines as per the uh, dictated by the government of India that needs to be looked into? And is it really ethical to offer experimental unproven interventions promising it to be an effective treatment and charging a fee? Because I am aware, I mean, not only in India, rest of the world, people are charging exorbitant amount of money and people think that you can buy anything with the, with the money. So is it really ethical to try and um, ask the patients? We do have some guidelines. I'm sure Dr. Chhabra will agree because he is a very key person holding uh, the ASSI society. And there, there are some guidelines on the National Society available. I just want to, uh, and in fact, this is the publication which I was talking about, uh, the only publication from our country by Dr. Chhabra. Uh, I'll just like this video to be played. This is a uh, short message by uh, Dr. P.S. Ramani, uh, which, uh, who, who was the president of uh, Association of Spine Surgeons of India. And uh, this is what he spoke. Just listen to him. Iska volume badega kya? in the manner I see and propagated more among the people rather than the doctors. I make a plea to Neurotrauma Society of India that to formulate guidelines on the use of stem cells in India in the manner I see and propagated more among the people rather than the doctors. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, I open the debate uh, with this note. This is what our president of uh, the, uh, he is a key person in the, in the spine. I'm sure both the speakers will agree to it. Let us see uh, who wins the battle. We have got enough stage, and uh, we are open to even the, the physical interaction. <laughs> Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a very appropriate topic because uh, if you see any newspaper any day, uh, there would be some publication on how people started walking after stem cell transplantation after any locomotor disability, whether it be spinal cord injuries or stroke. So what's the current status? Can we have the slides, please? Uh, so what's the current status? Uh, uh, let's not take it as a battle. Uh, let's take it as a bat battle which ultimately should be won by the patients or the people suffering with spinal cord injuries across the globe. Uh, and uh, there is a difference I would want to mark here between research, between ethical research, and between commercialization of research. So I think we should focus more on ethical research for the benefit of people with spinal cord injuries. I apologize for this time lag in between.
As the slides come up, I will uh, want to focus your attention on two good resources uh, where you can have more detailed information in this regard. One is www.elearnsci.org. It is a web resource available free of charge across, to the across the globe to all people, all health professionals involved in spinal cord injury management, has information in detail on spinal cord injury management, uh, whether it be um, on uh, stem cell therapy or any form of management of spinal cord injuries. The other resource is the International Spinal Cord Society's textbook on comprehensive management of spinal cord uh, injuries, recently launched in Montreal in May. And it has a whole section on translation, uh, translational research. Thanks for the slides. Now, I've been taught to defend stem cell usage in spinal cord injuries. And when any such debate comes in, uh, there are some questions which come to the mind. Is there a need? Is there a potential? And is there evidence that it works? So let's focus on it one by one. First, is there a need? We know that spinal cord injury is perhaps the most devastating ailment that can afflict mankind. And we know that it was initially described as an ailment not to be treated, and most spinal cord injured would succumb not directly due to the injury, but also due to the complications associated with it. And it was uh, only during the Second World War that things got changed, but before that in the First World War, 90% of the patients died within one year, and only 1% survived more than 20 years. And during the Second World War, these two gentlemen revolutionized spinal cord injury management and showed that if properly managed, they can lead a near normal lifestyle, even if from a wheelchair. We are aware that both primary and secondary mechanisms are involved. Uh, the primary mechanism taking place right at the moment of the injury, whether it is compression, distraction, acceleration, de uh, deceleration, or transaction. And then there is the secondary cascade. There are a host of secondary mechanisms which, are per which result in a perpetuating injury to the spinal cord for days or weeks after the spinal cord injury. How is spinal cord injury different than other injuries in the body? There is a lack of inherent ability of neurons to regenerate effectively for functional improvement. And that's why if there is a complete spinal cord injury, meaning if there is a complete loss of sensation or movement below the level of the injury, manifest by absent perianal sensation or voluntary anal contraction, then they are likely to remain complete for life. And hence, is there a need for stem cell research or to try to find a cure for spinal cord injuries? Try asking that for a spinal cord injury, spinal cord injured. They are desperate to find a cure. They are desperate to find anything which will help improve their situation, anything which can help them lead a better lifestyle. So that question is well answered. There's a definite need to look to, uh, to try to find for a cure for spinal cord injuries. Coming to the next question, is there a potential? Now, this would be very appropriately summarized by this statement from Michael J. Fox about stem cells in general. If the potential of stem cell research is realized, it would mean an end to the suffering of millions of people. If stem cell research succeeds, there isn't a person in the country who won't benefit or know somebody who will. So this is the potential of stem cell therapy per se. Uh, we know that stem cells replicate themselves or are able to differentiate into many cell types. And if we try to an an analyze the pathophysiology of spinal cord injury and the requirements for repair and try to understand the various cellular and molecular events that take place after spinal cord injury, which create a hostile environment for exam repair, and then try to devise a strategy to promote regeneration, the role of stem cells will become very clear. We also need to understand that in, in various phases after spinal cord injury, various pathophysiological changes have a role. 
and this understanding is also important to understand when and where which type of cells and which type of therapy to try to promote. So as a result there are various types of therapies which various types of approaches which have been propagated replacement and regenerative therapies and of late people are averse to this term therapy more appropriate term would be transplantation. So looking at the molecular events if it is cell death then cellular replacement if it is demyelination again cellular replacement if it is axon, axon retraction or degeneration again bridging various forms of uh, 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 strategies to promote regeneration or to promote release of beneficial cytokines like growth factors or promoting angiogenesis these are the various strategies which have been used and what would ultimately have an effect would depend on what kind of cell does the stem cell get changed into after transplantation whether it is oligodendrocyte neurons or astrocytes but this is the question which still needs to be answered and this is the challenge that we are still facing so there is a potential there is a definite potential for stem cells to work now coming to the question is there evidence that it works it's a very important question we know that after any research you need to go through certain phases before you get get them into clinical practice so at preclinical level various animal models have been used to test different stem cell populations uh, various models the rodents have been most often used there are various cell populations which have been tested and uh, we have summarized the various uh, preclinical evidence in both our publication in the Indian Journal of Orthopedics, Stem Cell Therapy in Spinal Trauma, Does It Have Scientific Validity? And in the ISCOS textbook for those who would want to go into detail. But the conclusion for preclinical evidence would be that at preclinical level, cellular interventions have been successful in facilitating repair or regeneration after spinal cord injuries with a various number of strategies and we may be in a stage of clinical research now, past preclinical uh, research stage. However, there have been various limitations due to differences in injury type between laboratory induced spinal cord injury and clinical SCI, difficulties in interpreting functional outcome in animals, and interspecies and interstrain differ differences in pathophysiology of spinal cord injuries. Now after preclinical evidence the next logical question would be do we have sufficient clinical evidence to offer stem cell transplantation in spinal cord injuries. There have been only 21 published studies so far that's what we are aware about and we have summarized this uh, in our publications. Uh, this publication which was referred to by Dr. Deepak Gupta where we showed in chronic spinal cord injured 18 months after the injury where any spontaneous potential to recovery would have plateaued that following the Carlos Lima technique of autologous mucosal transplant in chronic spinal cord injury the technique which had been shown to have a beneficial effect in another publication uh, we this study was done under the supervision of uh, ICMR and an international steering committee and we have up to a four year follow up now we could demonstrate safety we could not demonstrate any efficacy and we could show that there were some issues concerning increase in myelomalacia in the spinal cord per se after that we have another publication now and uh, a very recent publication this year on autologous bone marrow cell transplantation in acute spinal cord injury an Indian pilot study because people said you are transplanting in chronic patients where the plasticity may get reduced you, you may have more beneficial effects in acute patients and because bone marrow transplantation was the in thing another ICMR approved study where we had three arms with 21 subjects seven who were control seven where we injected intrathecally and seven where we injected directly into the trauma site 
So we have followed them up. Uh, our follow-up is uh, three years in some patients, two years in most. And again, we could demonstrate safety, but we could demo not demonstrate any efficacy. Between the three arms, there was no difference. Uh, this is the summary of uh, the published uh, clinical trials in the ISCOS textbook. And uh, as mentioned, we have also summarized it in our publication in Indian Journal of Orthopedics. If we were to see the common features amongst all publications, most are from emerging countries. Generally, there are a number of deficiencies in trial design. Most are open label studies and generally a control is lacking. The few studies which were properly done, like uh, the other study from Alan McKesim and our studies, no clinical efficacy could be demonstrated. Now why is there this difference? Uh, that could mainly be because of a host of confounding factors which are there when you do any such trial in spinal cord injuries. There is a natural progression of spinal cord injuries. We know that all incomplete injuries will improve with time. So if you have a transplant in an AISB patient, how can you attribute the improvement which takes place to the transplant and not to the natural history because most of them would recover anyway. And most of these studies have been done in incomplete subjects and there has been no improvement which has been documented in complete, complete injuries per se. Similarly, unless you take care of subject bias, observer bias, plasticity of the spinal cord and the effects of delayed decompression, you cannot attribute the success to the transplantation per se. So, uh, well, there is a need for well-designed studies because we are past the preclinical uh, pre phase. And in the clinical phase, there are a number of factors which need to be taken into consideration. When you, draw, when you design a good study and of course ethical concerns are also there because what is certainly proven is that there can be a host of side effects which can be there with such cellular transplantations and they need to be taken into consideration and the patients, the subjects need to be aware of these when you put them through a research study. So as mentioned by Dr. Deepak Gupta, there are ethical guidelines but there are also technical guidelines like the, there are a series of these four publications by ICCP panel on how to conduct a good clinical trial in the field of spinal cord injuries. One of the other reasons why there is good preclinical evidence but clinical evidence has failed, maybe also because any any injury which takes place, there are multitude of factors which come into play. So what is the current status is people think that it's not going to be one strategy, but a combination of strategies which is ultimately going to have a beneficial effect in spinal cord injuries. So other than cell replacement per se, where most of the studies have focused, you need to do immunomodulation, you need to have a trophic support, and you need to provide a scaffold on which the cells could grow. So to summarize, advances in pharmacological interventions, medical or surgical management, rehabilitation and cellular interventions pave the way for future therapies for achieving repair and regeneration after spinal cord injuries. Stem cell or cellular research holds a great promise for improving human health by restoring cellular and organ function. There are some cellular therapies which have been a standard, which have been accepted as a standard of care, like uh, stem cell transplants for leukemia and epithelial stem cell based treatments for burns and corneal disorders. However, most others remain experimental. So when it comes to spinal cord injuries in particular, there is a huge base of preclinical evidence in vitro and in animal models which suggests the safety and clinical efficacy of cellular therapies after spinal cord injuries. The data from clinical studies is not very encouraging and at times confounding. And most of these trials have been either phase one or phase two trials. It is necessary that evidence base for the efficacy of cell-based interventions must come from a valid clinical trial program. 
And due to the involvement of multiple cell type and the complexity of spinal cord injury, it is becoming increasingly clear, as we mentioned before, that a single approach may not be successful in achieving SCI repair. A multifactorial approach involving cell populations, scaffolding matrix, growth factor supplementation and scar removal is required to address this situation. And for the same re reason, an amalgamation of inputs from clinicians, pharmacologists, cell biologists and biomaterial engineers may be required to come up with this multi-pronged strategy. There are, there's a lot of focus on investigating new av avenues for facilitating repair and regeneration after SCI. A number of uh, studies are going, going on like the China SCI net. There was a lot of hype about uh, 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 transplantation in a single patient a study from a biosurgeon in Poland recently published where the person started walking after uh, uh, the stem cell transplantation. However, we need to under, even though this shows the potential, we should be a bit wary that uh, to conclude on the basis of a single case study. The future holds a great promise. It leaves a lot of scope for scientists and professionals to work in this field. And there is a great role for professionals and professional societies. They should create awareness, as was being mentioned, encourage ethical research as per guidelines and advocate legislation and its enforcement to discourage unethical practices like charging for experimental therapies, as was being taught. So, to conclude, is stem cell usage in SCI, is there a role? There is definitely a need, as we've talked about, and there is definitely a potential. There is a preclinical evidence. So we should use stem cells as transplantation and not as therapy right now because it is still experimental. We should do ethical research so that we are ultimately able to find a cure for these hapless patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chawla, for your wonderful talk. And uh, Dr. Good Deepak, morning. please take over. Yeah. So Dr. Chabda has actually taken a very, very political lecture. Very, demo, very, very political. I just want to ask you, sir, will you subject your patient of chronic spinal cord injury to stem cell therapy or not? Uh, I would only subject him as or him or her as part of a trial, uh, explaining the pros and cons of it, a proper trial with proper approvals. And since some of the strategies have not worked in our trials, we are looking for a new strategy and a combination of strategies which has good, which has shown good preclinical potential and then only advise a trial in the patient. Sir, with due respect, our patients believe what we say. So if you have a patient who comes with complete spinal cord injury, Dr. Chavda, you are my next to my God. Please cure me. What will you say? We should also understand that these patients are very desperate to try to find a cure. So even though they may think of a God, but if you try to depict the real situation that it is still experimental, some of them will still have that doubt. Why? Yesterday I read in the newspaper that that patient started talking. I have read in the website that you come to us, we will charge 3 lakh rupees and you will definitely show recovery. So many of them will have a doubt in this mind. So I always tell them, see, this is my opinion, but this opinion is also based on the opinion of a number of experts across the globe. But if you want to definitely have an answer, go on the website of any international or national society of standing. They have given their position statement on what stem cell therapy is. So that tends to have a better impact on them rather than individual opinions. Okay. How many in the house uh, would agree to Dr. Chabda after listening to his talk? Can I have a raise of hands? One, two, three. No. <laughs> this is not acceptable. <laughs> Five. So probably less than 10% of the audience are uh, kind of uh, shifting towards. Let's see. Uh, what is, just last question, uh, should it be charged? It can't be charged under the guidelines which are there. Any experimental procedure can't be charged. But people are charging for it, right? 
people are charging for it. Unethical, unethical. to be discouraged. In, in, okay, I'm still in, in your talk because you raised your hand before itself. This is not acceptable, Matthew. Okay. In so another we, recent conference that we had, we had a, a panel discussion on stem cell uh, transplantation in human SCI. It is, is it the time to move from guidelines to legislation, right? Because you have guidelines. You can't enforce those guidelines unless there is a legislation. And there is a need to have a legislation so that you can penalize people who are unethically doing such research so or who are unethically propagating it as a therapy and not as research. All right. So let me, without wasting time, let me invite Dr. Matthew Joseph. I'm not sure if you two guys have some interaction on round table and made <laughs> some mutual consensus. Let's see. We'll find out. works at long range. Okay, good afternoon. Dr. Chabra, that is unfair. Um, you know, a lot of these martial arts, can you hear me at the back? Am I audible? Okay. A uh, lot of these martial arts things you were thinking about, uh, the wrong talk. This is my next talk. Wrong, wrong slides. Excuse me. The next talk. Hey, they, they can, can they hear? Maybe it's, it's coming. Now, it's coming. Are giving two talks at a time, mm -hmm. the Yeah, but th that's the way I'm scheduled, so I can't do anything about it. Give one at a time. The wrong term. The other one. The human brain is a confused mark of... Which one? It says one. And we should get more people after... First one, Matthew, one. Matthew, Joseph, one. One. Right, so I, I'm in the position of, you know, what they say, these martial arts, they tell you to use your opponent's strength against them. So I'm in the position of having come ready to push to find that my opponent is pulling. And therefore I'm a little stuck because if you look at the title of my talk, it is saying you cannot do stem cell therapy. And I'm doing it after, after my, yeah, after the speaker was supposed to be speaking against me said, don't use stem cell therapy. So, which is why I was putting up my hands saying I agree with what Dr. Chabra says. Because he, 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 he pulled the ground out from under my feet. I mean, anyway, for what it's worth, I'll just go through what I prepared. But it really doesn't become a debate now because I am, he, he endorsed what I'm going to say. I'm endorsing what he already said. So, anyway, we have national guidelines, all right? And the national guidelines are for stem cell research. And if you look at the forward of what they say, they deliberately omitted the word therapy because most of the work done is still research. It's not therapy. Okay. So the <coughs> national guidelines for stem cell research, the title was left like that because they are not still part of standard of care. Okay. So several clinical trials have been done. Most are phase one, phase two, as Dr. Chabla has already said. And the forward continues to say, Unfortunately, hapless patients are being exploited and fraudulent practices need to be stopped. Um, the National Apex Committee for Stem Cell Ther Research and Therapy said there are no approved indications except from the, uh, from the hematopoietic disease, diseases. Uh, and now they've also added on the corneal, I mean, I haven't got that bit of the paper yet, but they're adding on corneal limbic cells as well, okay? And use of stem cells for any other purpose would be considered ethical if it's unethical if it's outside a trial. I just went on, you know, when you put up stem cells, you get these sponsored ads, okay, Mo mostly Indian. And when I went on one website, I didn't copy the page because I'm not sure if I had this sued for something. So I copied on the diseases they claim to treat. This is not complete. There, there's more. There's more below that. I mean, erectile dysfunction with stem cells? Limb ischemia? I mean, come on. And somewhere in that mumbo jumbo, they've got spinal cord injury as well. Somewhere in that list of things they claim to be able to treat is this thing. And these people charge huge amounts of money. Okay. When I searched um, stem cells, spinal cord injury with filter for humans in this thing, I'm sorry, I didn't come across, I didn't know why it wasn't there as part of the thing. I didn't come across your 
the last publication you showed me. This is a study from China. Okay, this is last one year. Study from China, where these are the, they injected 100 patients with chronic neurological conditions with intrathecal stem cells. And 47 improved, so they claim. But look at the list. Spine cord injury, cerebral palsy, traumatic brain injury, spinocerebral ataxia, motor neuron disease, stroke. They just took 100 neurological patients of any neurological condition and injected and said half of them improved. Okay, no controls, no nothing. Um, <coughs> study two, this is um, part of a supplement of the In International Association of neuro Restorate. I really can't even say the word. neuro Restoratology. Okay, they, they, it's a separate society now which has its own journal. But this is before that happened. The journal starts in 2015. This is in 2014. In the supplement, they say two patients who were in injected with spinal cord, two of them improved by one grade from A to C. But even their statement in that supplement was we need to encourage preclinical to come to clinical. They did not say therapy is ready. Um, if you look at other publications, I'll let you read that for yourself. And another publication. Huh? It's, it's all saying we are not ready for therapy. Okay? And the arguments usually made by the people who offer this as therapy is that it works in experiments. Yeah, so, so do a lot of things work. If you look at the things that worked in TBI, you know, hypothermia worked brilliantly, progesterone worked brilliantly. So many things work brilliantly and they don't work in clinical scenario. And something is doing, at least doing something for the patient, better than doing nothing, which is an argument given for a lot of futile surgical procedures. And the problem is you're doing it for profit. In many, many places around the world, you have a desperate patient, you have a desperate family, they can't tolerate the patient. You're giving them false hope. They really don't know, I mean, you don't know that it's going to work. And you charge large amounts of money, and sometimes because these people are so desperate, they sell their house, they sell their land, everything for this therapy of yours, which you have no proof it's going to work. And because stem cell therapy is not regulated in places like ours, like Dr. Chavra said, we have no legislation, Anybody can put up a website and claim to do anything and get enough desperate people to come. And therefore you find people coming from all over the world to us because we don't have proper regulations, because we don't have proper legislation. And you know, medical tourism, stem cell tourism. Now people come to us for stem cells because they can't get stem cells in their country where there is proper regulation. So I would conclude by saying what the, again this is from the guidelines again, saying any stem cell use must be done only within the purview of a clinical trial. And every other use of stem cells outside an approved trial can be, should be considered as malpractice. This is all statements, I and mean, these are all statements. I just copy, I don't normally make busy slides like this. I don't put slides with so much text on them. But this is just copy paste from existing guidelines, existing documents, national level documents, which unfortunately, we don't have the, re uh, the legislation to enforce. Thank you. Can we have Dr. Matthew and Dr. Chabra in the center? Uh, I mean, probably let there be some distance between the two of them. So, so I, I'm really confused. Are we all doing malpractice, this means? Are we all doing malpractice in this country? I because people are offering stem cell therapies to the patients, people are charging, so what is it? I think the debate, uh, we need to focus attention on what were the exact wordings of the debate. Yes. Stem cell usage in spinal cord injuries. It was not stem cell therapy in spinal cord injuries. There's a difference between usage and therapy. The fact that there are various people who are doing unethical practices, the fact that there are various people who are not doing research properly, right, does not mean that you should try to withhold progressive, progressive research. So there is a need for having a proper clinical trials to stem cell usage should be properly and ethically done 
and I think that is a consensus statement. It's still not the stage for stem cell therapy. Uh, it is not being ethically done in the country. Uh, we have discussed that. One of the aspects that we didn't discuss is it's not only the funds that they lose. Uh, we are doing a separate study and we are going to publish it soon. Uh, if you see the psychosocial devastation that takes place on a subject, who is shown a carrot that you have a possibility that you will recover soon, so he stops going through the rehabilitation process, which is an accepted standard of care today, because tomorrow I'm going to walk, why should I go through this rehabilitation process to make me independent from a wheelchair? They spend precious resources, they would, st they would sell their remaining farmland for 3 lakhs, 2 lakh rupees. Then for two years they go through this therapy, at the end of two years, when there is no result and they have huge bed sores, they are psychologically devastated, they are sold out of all resources, I think this is criminal. And there is a time that we need to put an end to this. The government needs to wake up to the call. And that's why we had that debate in our last Spinal Cord Society meeting, where the government representatives were also called to participate. I think uh, many people don't know that we take one crore project in 85 about 30 years back because there are a lot of papers from US that in spinal cord injury you can have a stem cell transplant in the brain or the brain injury and this was after the Mr. Gopal Das who gave a talk that that uh, fetal brain transplant in head injury and spinal cord injury. Dr. Tondon and me took about current contest about five about half a million dollar and we studied between 1984 to 1990 in both guinea pig, rat, and monkeys. I did about 20 cesarean monkeys, taking the embryo in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days to standardize what embryonic brain cell will work in spinal cord injury, in Parkinsonism, in, in uh, damage, MPTP damage, uh, estereocycle, and also Parkinsonism. We also put the retinal damage and put embryonic uh, brain cells, which were premature neurons, okay? We showed the neuron grew in different environment. Neurons also have axonal proliferation. They secret dopamine by the markers. But after certain time, or six or eight months, the stem cell which is implanted as embryonic brain cell also have a natural degeneration. And we concluded that embryonic brain cells taken from the fetus with the immature multipotent cells can grow to cerebellar cells, can go to substantia nigra cells, and also go, go to cerebral neuron, which was proved depending on the topographic and the environmental factors. And we said in about 20 papers published between 1985 and 90, the stem cell therapy has a very huge, huge future potential. I am happy or not, I don't know, after 30 years, after 85 talking about 2015, we are in the square one. We had also taken, I don't know how many of you know, the MPTP specimen from the human embryo which was aborted and cultured neuron put in. And we also concluded that it has no therapeutic uh, result. There's no therapeutic result. So we are not only talking guinea pig, we talk about guinea pig, rat, a monkey and human. Thank so you. the question is that of 30 years of research of international of various organizations, we have not made any progress in this stem cell research. Thank you. There is Unfortunate, a but the fact. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra. There is a comment from Hossam Al Juhani. Yeah, Hossam. Uh, thank you all for this wonderful um, overview of how critical this is, because you're you're playing on people in need, desperate need and you want to do it in a very, very controlled, safe manner, which is the excellent way to do it. Now, what is discouraging, actually, is that the study that you referred to, where the, um, the 47 improved out of 100, uh, what's done in China, is actually published in an Indian journal. Yes. So I think this is the missing link that we have to educate the public 
educate the physicians, but also legislate the practice of physicians, but also include the medical editors, because this is what's going to disseminate the wrong information continuously. You, you improve in the legislative part, but the medical editors, they're not as stringent, and they allow this poor quality evidence to emerge. And this is why we are losing battle every time. You take two steps forward and one step back and maybe two steps back. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for your comments. So I, may, I may ask, uh, do we have some legislature as yet in our country or not? I mean, yes, we have. Uh, the legislation has been um, planned since, uh, I think, four years. Since uh, two, two to three years ago, we were part of a public consultation before a legislation is there. You need to, yeah, we need to go to various parts of the country to people and professionals. So, but unfortunately, it's still hanging there after the last stage, which has been there. So, uh, we still don't have a legislation. We still only have guidelines. But uh, there is a pressure from all. Now, unfortunately, as we discuss here on stem cell therapy, within a few kilometers of here, yes. there would have been at least five stem cell therapies which would have taken place, right? And the ICMR went there to inspect the facility. They were standing there with the advocate denying uh, uh, the inspection to be done. So this is the state of the affairs that we are in. Is anybody free to go through the 2010 ethic regulation of MCI? 2010, there are three ethic regulations on MCI. One is 2003. 2007 and 2010. And if you go through ethics regulation, if a person is questioned and a complaint is lodged, his reg medical registration can be cancelled for three years. But so it is not what is a legislature, is the criminal and the financial. But there is definite guidelines in MCI. If somebody, somebody does malpractice, he can be charged and his medical registration will be cancelled at least for three years. Is it not correct, Dr. Chawda? 2010? Yes, sir. We yes, don't sir. follow. That's That's a, that is true for the instrumentation and disc re removal. How many disc, poor discs are removed for no reason? So it is not only spinal cord injury. It is right versus wrong. Ethical versus unethical. There are people always in the world, those who do malpractice. But the question is that the proportion is so small that it is get neglected, right? The question is that do we practice right medicine versus wrong medicine? Ethical medicine versus unethical medicine. Follow the rules, sir. It is helmet, is a true. So not putting the helmet is a also a unethical, right? In the context of Supreme Court has passed a rule, everybody put a helmet, put a seat belt. But how many neurosurgeons don't put it? I, when I go out of the country, out of the Delhi, my neurosurgery friend says it is only for Delhi. They don't put a seat belt and say, hey, Dr. Mahapada, it doesn't apply for the Bhuvaneswar or Kattak, so for the Pune or Bombay. The so when the rule is made, it's not made for Delhi because Supreme Court exists in Delhi. So it is we, we the educated mass don't follow it. What do we expect from a farmer or a laborer or a or a Delhi wage by laborer? Is not correct. So if I may understand the the mutual consensus between the two speakers today is we should be very careful with the word. It's stem cell uses, not stem cell therapy. Number one, it is experimental. Number two. If it is to be done, it should be done as a part of a well-designed, randomized control trial. Number four, you should not be charging anything to the patients. Is it acceptable? So no casualty in today's discussion. So you may both leave the stage. Thank you very much. I had a turban. He didn't have a helmet on. That's why I reconciled. We'll move on to the next CME, which will be on controversies in neurotrauma. Uh, there'll be a debate on ICP monitoring and neurotrauma. May I call upon the chairpersons, Dr. Deepak Agarwal, additional professor in All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Dr. Dhananjay Bhatt, additional professor at Nimhans, Bangalore. And the moderator for the session is going to be Dr. Subodh Raju from the Kamineni Hospitals, Hyderabad. Thank you.
Okay, uh, the last session prior to lunch, another hot topic of ICP monitoring. I'd like to hand over the mic to Subodh to continue. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, before lunch, food for thought, ICP monitoring and clinical use. Uh, debate uh, basically is in an, uh, what we are, Dr. Michael is here. He works in a very ideal scenario. In India, uh, we have hardly 12 to 15 centers which will be having, if at most, an ideal scenario for all monitoring and management of severe traumatic brain injury. So whether ICP monitoring, uh, the debate is basically on ICP monitoring and TBI. Okay, should we do it or we it is not essential. I will not tell it that we should not do it. It is not an essential part. Like if anyone doesn't have an ICP monitor, it's, it should not consider that it is a criminal that you don't have an ICP monitor and you're not monitoring it. And uh, so the debate will start with Dr. Michael. He'll be speaking for the debate. Before that, how many of you feel that IC monitoring should be done? Deepak, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's less than, <laughs> I'll not talk about Matthew now. <laughs> okay, I think a majority uh, feel that we can uh, do away, away with IC monitoring. Even if we don't have it, then also we monitor the patient well. Dr. Michael, please. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizer for inviting me here. It's my first time in New Delhi. It's very enlightening. Um, I like very much your pledge. Um, it's, we don't have a similar one in the U.S. Uh, I do think we bo both our countries may need a similar pledge for not electing dumb politicians, but I think that's the next topic. Uh, so we can have consensus on that. Um, can we have the slides, please? Oh, thank you. Um, so I was chosen to uh, give the pro side of the argument for ICP monitoring for TBI. Um, uh, I'm required by my institution to put this slide up for everyone. It just says that I have several grants that are um, funded by the National Institute of Health by the U.S., uh, but none of them actually affect my opinions, and they don't pay me anything for it. They just pay my, my salary, gets paid by my institution. But uh, I do think there are several incontrovertible facts about ICP monitoring for TBI. Um, I have heard this morning that this is the 50th anniversary of uh, this fine institute. It's actually been 50 years since the first ICP monitor uh, paper was published uh, in the journal Neurosurgery, uh, demonstrating that uh, it was feasible and possible uh, in patients. Uh, and it has been a standard of care in many parts of the world, including all U.S. Uh, sites, all U.S. Um, uh, states for, for decades. Uh, the rationale for using ICP monitoring is the observation early that if you started herniating and you had an ICP that was reaching your blood pressure, you could obviously herniate and die. And that was obviously a thing people wanted to avoid. Um, it's been used to inform clinical decisions and dominate much of the field for severe TBI for at least the last 25 years. There have been guidelines published by the Brain Trauma Foundation, which is what I'm going to base most of my arguments on, that have argued for its use for, uh, for decades. And only a single paper in the last few years has, uh, has been published to uh, question that. Uh, I think the differentiation between using a monitor and knowing exactly what threshold is best for every patient are two different questions. Uh, I, th I agree completely that we may not know exactly the threshold to treat ICP, but I think not having a monitor in place at all, I think, is, uh, is risky and dangerous. So uh, I'm on, on this side of the argument, I have just a few propositions to, to make my case. Uh, and I, I always get people back on time, so uh, moderator or Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to get us back on time. But uh, ISP monitoring has been established for the last 50 years, as I said, and mortality from, se from severe TBI has decreased in a similar time frame. This first slide is from a, a, a paper that was published uh, a few years ago that looked at all the different mor the mortality rates of all the published studies on severe TBI. You can see here a stepwise decrease in mortality rates that, that were being uh, reported by Again, leaders in the field, both from the U.S., Europe, all, all, the, all over the world. You can see here, right around 1965, that there's been a precipitous drop in 
ISP mortality rates that have been reported. You can make any arguments you want as to what factors might have led to this, better ICU care, better neurosurgical care, but it is, uh, a, a, it is a fact that mortality, <coughs> mortality rates in published studies are decreasing. This is US-based based data from the CDC. Again, here in the green bar, you can see the mortality rate has been decreasing steadily down to about 17% in the most recent estimate. And I think all this comes back to uh, are you following guidelines, and the guidelines do state ISP monitoring was a, is a part of, of therapy for severe TBI. I think the other, the second <laughs> proposition I'd make to you is that there's many studies that demonstrated that patients undergo ISP monitoring have better outcomes. Uh, and this, most of this comes from retrospective studies. Um, in this study from uh, Alali uh, and, and colleagues, they looked at 10,000 patients, and this is a very small type, and I apologize for that at the beginning, but I want to show you that there's about 10,000 patients in the retrospective database, and they looked at a number of factors, including um, number of ICU beds, uh, imaging findings, and a number of other things that, that could be a factor in related to outcomes. And this is their outcomes, and to get to the bottom line behind it is that um, the odds ratio or the, the effect of mortality was amongst the most significant findings they could find, stronger than GCS scores, stronger than other factors, to show that there's a beneficial effect to having ISP monitor in place. Now, as a retrospective study, you could argue that if they put, if they put monitors into patients who, if they, if they re refused monitoring some patients, but monitored others who may be more viable, there's a differential, but still, uh, the, the, the uh, various populations were relatively well controlled. Looking at the different quartiles of this study, so if you look at the quartile that, um, that had the lowest mortality, they had the highest ICP uh, monitoring rate, and then it sequentially gets back down to uh, the, lowest, the, the, um, uh, the lowest quartile, which had the average uh, mortality rate. So you can see here that as ICP monitoring increased uh, in, the, in these patients, their mortality decreased. Um, another article uh, by folks from New York State uh, looked at uh, different, different study populations or different patients who either received monitoring, didn't receive monitoring, again, adults and children, this one as well. I'm a pedi pediatric person, so I sort of have a, a soft spot for these kind of things, but 1,300 patients, 1,400 uh, that were both adults and children. If you look at the entire patient population here in this, in this cohort, um, there was about 1,200 patients who had an uh, ICP monitor placed on day one or two. They had a 19% mortality rate of the 244 patients that did not have a monitor placed that had the same criteria, they had a 32% mortality rate. So again, to me, this argues that there is a beneficial effect to the monitoring of patients, again, 2,000 patients strong study. Uh, looking at regression models for the two-week mortality in these patients, uh, ICP monitoring was, again, a strong factor of 0.64 odds ratio demonstrating effect, uh, which, again, is promising that at least in this retrospective study, and other <coughs> factors as well, age, industry CS score, hypotension, other fa findings were, uh, that we, we believe are important for mortality were also there. But again, logistical regression says that IC monitoring was associated with beneficial effect. Uh, Linda Gerber put, published another paper. Again, this is another 2,000 patient study. Uh, the age is much younger here. The other age was around the 60. This is around 36. Uh, looking again at which factor associated with better outcome. Um, in this case, mortality rate ratio here, uh, patients between 2001 and 2003, where the mortality rate was 22 percent, it decreased subsequently to 2000, 2009 to 13 to 43 percent. Associated with that was an increased compliance with ICP uh, monitoring guidelines. To as you can see here, is almost a linear, it's almost a linear relationship where the more ICP monitoring you got, the less mortality you had. Again, to me, just is it's indirect evidence, but I think it's relatively persuasive that ICP monitoring can play a role in a, in, a, in patients with severe TBI. Uh, lastly, uh, the Talbing paper, um, again, a smaller patient population, about 200 patients altogether. Um, median age, again, closer to 40, uh, so another uh, more uh, reasonable patient population for the population we're talking about.